I've fortunately crossed paths with all of you at some point. Um, and I miss these, I miss these uh, serendipitous moments where you bump into people like this. This is what we're missing, isn't it, right now? But it's going to come back soon. Um, so we have um, Lucy standing. Um, and when we met, you were running something called Vivo. And you can take us back through this journey. Um, and it's now called Brave Starts, amongst other things. Um, Gabby Hersham, uh, co-founder of the incredible Huckle Tree, co-working uh, business brand network of spaces and, and community where we've been lucky to host so many brilliant rebel book clubs over the years and where i last bumped into lucas london who lucas you were uh, launching another or being the face for another brand that night but have since rapidly uh it seems to me anyway uh, got another exciting business up and running lick london which you're going to tell us all about in a second so i guess the starting point for this conversation of uh, is now a good time to start a business would be rather than discuss the, the situation and the wildness of, of today is to go back um, in our own journeys and think about when we started either the business that you're running today or another business and how much did, uh, what was it? Uh, what did you start and why? And how much did the timing of your entry into that market, how important was it? Did you pay attention to what was going on in the market? What was going on? Um, so take us back, Lucy. Do you want to do you want to kick us kick off and and feel free to introduce yourself a little bit more so people who don't know you can can understand your background. Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, my background is I'm a psychologist, so I've always been interested. I used to my kind of corporate background was running global recruitment for investment banks and strategy consulting firms, um, and it was because I noticed that graduates who came through on intern programs over time tended to be happier, got better bonuses as a percentage of salary, and were more enjoying their job and being better at it. Um, they were producing and, and working harder and enjoying things more than graduates. And shouldn't really be any rocket science to think that the more you know about the job before you go into it, the more likely you are to make the right decision for yourself. Um, I started Vivo about three years ago, and I would say that the timing of that at that point wasn't right. Um, I still think it's a brilliant idea. I rebranded it to be a not-for-profit. But I would honestly say that as far as timing is concerned, um, I'm, I'm going to agree with everyone and say there isn't a great time. Um, I certainly haven't nailed it yet. But I think now is probably a much better time for me now um, than it's ever been. And, and just to dig into that a bit more, Lucy, before we come on to, to Gabby and Lucas, what was... In, when you say the timing wasn't right for Vivo, and, and give us the value proposition again of exactly what it was and uh, and who it was for, was it was it timing for you? Was it something particular that's been going on in the career change uh, recruitment world, or or was it a combination of the two? I know it's still quite maybe yeah. early to reflect on that, but do you have a sense? Yeah, I do. I, I would say that you know three four years ago, I would say that certainly employers much less likely to want to support employees going part-time, exploring interests outside of work. I think now the argument to say, you know what, maybe we can't recruit everyone 100% of the time, five days a week. Maybe actually as a responsible employer, we should be helping people who have maybe got an idea that they want to build on the side. Maybe we can support that and be a sociable, responsible employer at the same time. I think that will carry more weight now because my business is not for profit. And I think that message is going to be a stronger message now. And do you think... Uh, just just one more question on the on going back to Vivo. Was it do you think you could ever have anticipated that or did you have to live the the the, the beginning, of the startup journey yourself in order to learn that it wasn't quite the right timing to evolve and pivot into what you're oh doing? Oh my god, now? completely. I mean, because I mean I'm still learning now. But I mean the other reason why it wasn't right, it wasn't necessarily down to timing, it's just because I don't know everything. You know, and it's you only know what you're gonna enjoy. I mean, it's part of the whole Vivo proposition before you want to be a hotel inspector or before you want to go and be a food taster just try it first because you might find the reality is very very different from what you dream it think, you know what you think it is yeah. uh, and the same was true for me I mean I didn't know anything about building websites still don't know anything about search engine optimization I'm really not sure I've nailed marketing if you read the copy on my website I'm not sure it's brilliant um, but I still think that the idea I in fact I don't think it I know it I know it because we've now I've now got the confidence because we've done so many people have kind of gone through and shadowed things and are now much, much happier, have made better decisions. So you just learn. You can't if you wait, you'll wait forever. Um, and, the, and actually, the more that you start doing things, that's the beauty of the process. When you do it, you learn through doing. You don't learn through thinking. 
you almost have to earn your timing, your good timing by actually getting to the start line somewhere yeah. down the road. Oh and God. Gabby, yeah. you, you've had an amazing journey. Um, I don't know what you want to talk about, but um, take us back to a moment where you launched something where timing played a part. Cool, thanks Ben. Hi everyone, um, I hope you are having an amazing day. Um, so as Ben mentioned earlier, I am uh, one of the two co-founders and the CEO of Huckletree. Um, Huckletree is a workspace accelerator group, and as we like to think of it, a home for conscious entrepreneurship. Um, doesn't mean that all of the entrepreneurs within our membership and our community are building nonprofits, but it means that we like to um, bring uh, startups and businesses into our fold that are conscious of their surroundings and, and looking to create and do better for the world in some way. Um, so it could be a SaaS product, but they could have a very comprehensive DNI strategy, for example. Um, we've grown, so we launched in 2014, and I'm gonna come back to the timing of that in a second, but just to give some background, we uh, launched our first space in 2014, and we've grown from then from then to now to uh, seven communities across uh, three markets and uh, a team of around 80 people. So the learnings have been huge on my side. I've gone from being a first time entrepreneur, I'm still a first time entrepreneur, but hopefully with a little bit more knowledge today than I had back in 2014. In terms of the timing, it's actually really interesting. And I hadn't thought about this before you kind of pointed it out then, but it's very relevant, the timing of Huckletree in, 20, in 2014 or kind of when we started to what was happening in the world. So I um, was actually living in New York um, in 2007, 2008. Um, when the whole world around us collapsed as we knew it. Um, and I saw firsthand how the sharing economy sprouted up out of that. Um, and actually, arguably, the co-working industry was one of the industries that exploded. It was there before the recession, but the recession really exploded uh, the take up and the engagement in it because obviously people didn't want to be locked into long-term leases and a lot, a lot more people were starting their own businesses. So funnily enough for us, um, it, it, and I definitely kind of started on the project pre-launch in 2014 as a first-time entrepreneur. It took me a couple of years to get to the point where we launched our first space, um, but it was directly related, our industry was directly related to um, the events of 2007, 2008. So hopefully that's a good thing. So yeah, it is, it is in terms of, it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the time you were so focused on getting it out there that it's only in hindsight you, you see what part it's played in your story so far. Um, and just just bring it uh, it up to date, Gabby. What does it mean? I oh, no, no. Let's let's pause this because I feel like that this is actually quite a big part of the story and the jigsaw. We'll come back round on round two. So uh, I have so many questions. One up, Lucas. Um, tell us about timing and entrepreneurship in your in your life. When does when has it collided and led to something? Yeah, sure. So hi everyone. Um, so when we first met, uh, I was running international for a marketplace called Airtasker. And I left that business with my co-founder, Sam, to set up Lick Home, which is um, a home decor brand. It's all focused around selling paint, wallpaper, and everything you need to decorate. And it's basically replacing those uh, sort of miserable trips to the DIY store on, a, on the weekend. Um, we actually, uh, so I guess there's two sides of when it was right, when it was right for me to start a business and when it was right time for this business. Um, we launched Lick on the day the country was put under lockdown. Um, so it, uh, which was not planned. Um, and obviously that's, we've only known this period. So hindsight will, will in the future, we'll find out whether it was the right time. Obviously for our, um, business, it was quite a unique time because we were competing against physical stores that were, that were closing down at a time when people were at home and, and wanted to decorate. So, you know, we saw search volume for our products go up on Google, um, sort of 400% to what they were before. So, uh, you know, it seemed like it was a, it's been a positive time to launch this business. And our thesis really is that uh, online adoption has increased and the focus for remote working and the focus on the home in particular has increased. So, it, you know, our argument is definitely it, it's a favorable time to launch this business. For me, um, I felt it was the right time because I'd spent the sort of last 10 years collecting different skill sets from different experiences that came together um, to to be in a place where I was ready to start this business. I'm definitely still got a lot of skill sets to collect, but it was sort of, you know, understanding of everything from recruitment to growth to finance that that led me to feel like I was in, in the right place personally to, to build the business. 
And it, it you know, amazing that you uh, you launched on the day of lockdown. Um, did you sense? I know it's only a few months, and it must have been pretty intense for you. Uh, but did you sense that? Uh, did you have the confidence, obviously, to launch at that point because you thought, "I can see what's coming here. We can see that people are going to be stuck at home." Or was it more because you were committed to to get this thing out into the world? Yeah, absolutely not the confidence. We just sort of a week before we launched, or we sent an email out to our shareholders, all saying, you know, we were holding back. We, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, and then you know, a few a few days later, we thought, hang on, you know, there's definitely a growth in demand. Um, this might actually be a, an optimum time to to launch. And I guess that's the difference of we were always going to launch is whether we were going to sort of scale or be dormant. Um, we basically uh, worked as hard as we could to launch as quick as possible, and that was the day that we became ready to go live. Uh, we had huge challenges on the supply chain, so we definitely wasn't prepared, weren't prepared for the increase in demand, and our supply chain kind of ground to a halt over the time. So it's not like we. So this is sorry, just to jump in, because this is fascinating, isn't it? How you went from a this is our forecasted launch, like hopefully what the demand will be, and then was it. Was it a little delay and then it suddenly shot up? And how were people discovering you? Was it through ads or was there some PR? What happened? Well, we've, we, we, we haven't had um, the stock to really push. So we were actually throttling growth as best we could. We were not spending on paid acquisition uh, or spending a very little amount. Uh, we're doing everything we could to kind of balance the uh, not, you know, not upsetting our customers by not being able to fill the orders, but also taking, you know, I guess, advantage of the situation where there was a, a growth in demand. It's not like we've been able to charge like we would have liked to be, um, but we could definitely, it was the right time to build a brand, I think, or start building a brand because it was the increased focus on on our business that, that's been, um, I guess, just a great start. You know, it, it's, just, it's just given us a lot more sort of, um, speed to launch um you know we haven't overnight grown into this massive business far from but it's just been a favorable start and i think the most important thing is that change in market dynamics that we think that's going to go on now that's that's the more important factor you know you can't build a business just because over a short period of time people want your products because they're bored at home decorating um yeah, yeah. but it's given it's given you a kickstart in in a way that maybe others in the haven't had but you've worked for it as well yeah absolutely uh, it's fascinating, Lucas. So, Lucy, so from a psychological point of view, this is such an intense uh, time for for obviously all humans, <laughs> but especially if you are a founder or you're trying to you're looking to become a founder of a, a business or an a enterprise of any kind. The questions of like you know the the back and forth in your head between this is the right time or this is the wrong time are probably stronger than they were before, and there's a load of opinion as well. So, you know, what's what? How do you manage in your own work and and world to deal with the this extra level of uh, intensity and and the journey that's already an up and down one, as we all know. How what's what are your what's your how have you used your own toolkit to in your work? Um. I mean, if I'm being a bit honest about it, I think I think I've got an incredibly thick skin and I'm very chilled out. So if there's a sort of psychological profile on it, it's neuroticism. Um, people who are generally speaking anxious warriors um, are probably maybe think twice about going into the entrepreneurship journey and whether or not that's going to be right for you, because it's always going to be more stressful in times like now. Um, very strong negative correlation with entrepreneurship and neuroticism. Um, if, however, you're pretty thick skinned, chilled out, you're the sort of person who tends to be quite spontaneous and can react to spontaneous circumstances um, positively, then now's as good a time as any. Okay. And in terms of those skills, uh, it's, a, it's they're about learning them as much as being part of who you are, right? So if if you are someone who really wants to or is already doing it, um and you feel like your anxiety levels have gone up a bit over the last few months understandably what are the best tactics to build that kind of you know the resilience and is it does it, it because is it like okay well i'm i'm feeling anxious therefore i should never go into this or is it just a case of like be a bit more careful in terms of when you get get something going um i think i think as long as you're sensible about it i mean i think if you look at if you look at research around what kind of companies tend to be really successful it's not the people who go headlong flying into things with all the bluster and gust of 
and not really a thought through, well planned out plan. It's the people who actually will start slow, do something on the side, test it out. They don't go plowing into building huge, overly complicated it's little things, little steps, but really quite conscientious, really quite thinking about each stage, taking each day as it comes, learning from what's going on around you, but maybe not piling everything in and putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, because then that's just going to overload any kind of anxiety levels you will already be experiencing. Yeah, so offset your own risk as much as you can. It makes sense. And and Gabby, what's happened uh, to Huckletree since lockdown? You Your core business was about bringing people together in physical spaces. Uh, what have you done? Well, I guess it's still about bringing people together, albeit we've kind of obviously migrated to digital over the past few months. It, Lucy, I just I, I found what you were saying really interesting, um, particularly because I'm probably the exact opposite of everything that you just mentioned. I am extremely anxious, anxious and a bit like a torpedo. Um, so maybe that makes me the worst profile of entrepreneur. But I think um, what I've seen that has really helped me and Huckletree over the past few months is that for the anxious personalities having a really great team around to help you obviously kind of hash out the process. This is a first for all of us. We're all um, facing a crisis situation, um, especially, you know, first time entrepreneurs who've only been in the game sort of six or seven years for the first time. And knowing how to handle each, each stage has not been something that we've ever done before. So we kind of all came together and you know, everything happened and one of us called it early. And then, you know, when we went into lockdown, another one of our kind of senior team put together a plan. And then another one of us put together a thought piece around what this means for our industry. And we kind of saw ourselves through the past few months, each one contributing uh, in his or her own way. And that has been um, a massive source of, of, of relief for me as, as an entrepreneur and, and I think strength for us as a business over the past few months. But Ben, to answer your question, look, obviously we, ha we have actually been open. Our spaces have actually been open all this time, obviously, because the government never actually officially kind of told offices to close. Um, they've been quiet, but I think the, the beauty that we've seen is that my entire team, um, I think we've always been a very ambitious and very fast moving team, but no, never more so than in the past few months. I've really just seen the entire team fighting for the business on all fronts, um, fighting, you know, to save our members, fighting to close new deals, fighting to release new products, to, to iterate on them, fighting for the business, fighting for our jobs, all of us. And um, actually, I, for me as an entrepreneur, the past few months have actually been, and it's a crazy thing to say, but I, I mean it, you know, completely truthfully, the most exciting few months um, in the since the inception of our business. And 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 it's interesting. I could never have predicted that. So yeah. and and uh, yeah, when you look at so for, from someone who's a a friend of and um, knows a bunch of your your wonderful community. It's it's that thing of going back to the the values and they, them shining through at this moment. So the purpose and the sort of conscientious side of business being so crucial when you're just like, well, does it matter whether we have a space or we don't have a space? How do we help each other out? And just, just building on that, Gabby, what about the community itself? So you're supporting entrepreneurs, founders to build their own businesses like Virgin Startup. Um, what's What have you seen within your community that's been going on in the last three months? I guess the most thing we've seen is a lot of people fighting very hard to preserve runway. Um, and, and that's probably the biggest tip that we could give to to startup businesses at this moment in time, right, is, is your, your cash is king right now. So do whatever you can to make it last as long as you can. Um, and I think, you know, we've definitely seen that in all businesses of all sizes from the very early stage to the large corporates. Um, over the past over the past few months um we've seen you know we haven't seen that many businesses actually close their doors which is positive um but obviously that depends on how much how long you know this is going to go on for if there is going to be um you know just how long everything is going to last for but um but we've 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 seen a lot of people fighting for a runway and excitingly we've just seen a lot of entrepreneurs coming together and supporting each other sharing their knowledge sharing resources um, sharing experiences really supporting the ecosystem and i think again that for me has been a massive positive that has come out of everything yeah that's uh, that's great to hear and um lucas what about cash in your your new business have you been fighting to protect it or because you've you've seen this growth or demand increase if you just gone like we've got to go for it and use this investment um s smartly but also quickly 
But I think it's definitely still a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, and especially in particular with the supply chain. So we've, we've always been, um, we, well, we haven't been around for too long, but are very conservative um, and making sure that we, you know, are being um, strict with our cash flow and, and in this current uncertain market, we've <laughs> accelerated um, our funding round that we were planning to do uh, at the beginning of next year. And we've just signed a term sheet with the lead VC. Um, so have kind of accelerated that plan um, to raise capital for, for, for sort of these reasons. Um, and so what I wanted to challenge ourselves to do now, and as I do this, I'm going to ask uh, people who are following on, 180 of you are following along. Um, thank you for being with us. And also I can see some of you are sharing your, your projects and your ventures and your businesses. That's fantastic. Please keep doing that in the, in the chat and you'll be able to do it on video um, in rooms and after we finish this conversation. Um, but please drop into the chat questions that you have um, directly for any of us individually or as a group. This is your chance. So throw them out there um, now. That would be great. So a little challenge for us, a little thought experiment for us. If we weren't 150 percent on our own projects right now and we had the chance to maybe consider um, starting something new, would would what would you be thinking about? Would you be thinking about a problem that's um, that's something that you've always been interested in and is related to to what you care about or what you're an expert in or would you be saying actually looking around at, the, at the, this changing world i would pivot my curiosity and interest into this space i might explore this a little bit more is there are there certain industries that would be like oh i'm gonna go and go and you know learn a little bit more about it what might you consider lucy um, oh my god i've got three business ideas that i think would be amazing go on give them away okay number one garden delivery stuff right i want plants in my garden but i don't want to select by stupid latin names i want to select by color i want purple things that flower all year round they're okay in shade so those sorts of filtering things and they deliver business idea number one doesn't right. exist. lick for, lick really? for plants okay. don't don't go. get distracted lucas <laughs> no, <laughs> number two i think mobile chefs i don't want delivery food that's cold and then i'm going to chuck away all the packaging and i think that's bollocks sorry um I think a chef that comes to your house that you can order once or twice a week or whatever it might be with friends that cooks like a vegan meal or something like that, mobile, clean, COVID, whatever, amazing. And then the last thing I think is education. I love the fact that my kids are at school, versus, sorry, at home half the time. And how much do I hate school run in the morning? And that's bad for traffic. I'd love a school that's like two and a half days a week, come in and do assemblies, science, practical experiments and things like that, two and a half days a week. Do all of on my lessons at home because really, why do we need this Victorian era of thirty kids in a classroom all doing the same test at the same time in front of each other? It seems weird. So yeah, three good ideas for you. Hopefully, excellent. Well, listen, uh, Lucy, um, we've got here. Da, 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 Tim Stoller says, "Ah, Lucy, we're on it already." Tim, what are you on? Which one of those? Tell us. Um, this is the other thing that that happens when you share ideas. People go, oh, yeah, I've seen someone do that. And then, of course, that is a universal truth, whatever. I no want to hear a, about it. No one's got a unique idea, it. just how they how they get them out there. Um, so just ask Gabby and, and Lucas, then we'll come on to some more of the, of the questions. Gabby. Yeah, so uh, Lucy, again, um, I'm probably the opposite of you in this situation, that nothing feels as good as when I drop my kids at, at nursery in the morning. I think after four months of my wild four and a half year old running around literally behind me on Zoom meetings, I'm just very, very relieved to drop him at those gates every morning. Um, but I fully agree that ed tech, children's education is something um, really exciting. I've actually noticed my son's at that age where he starts questioning everything in a very deep um, and spiritual way and I don't have any of the answers. So I think that somebody needs to launch a business which provides parents with answers to questions like what happens when we die? Because all kids ask that and I have no idea how to answer it. Um, so ed tech for kids, I'm really um, interested in and think there's a massive opportunity there. Um, and I think fitness and well-being would be the other category. I, I haven't gone specifically into like specific businesses that I would want to set up, but you can probably see a Peloton bike here in the background. Um, my husband's a partner at a, at a VC fund and it's one of their investments, but um, it has exploded over the past few months. And yeah. um, it's it's been really interesting to watch their share price just keep going up and up and up and up uh, since lockdown. So, and deliveries of them, you kind of see the, the vans just dropping off Peloton bikes. Um, so I think I think that would be a, another area for me. Thanks Gabby, what you got Lucas? 
I think uh, I think one idea is enough for me, but I'll, I might explain the, maybe the process, which is yeah. I started my career as an analyst, so I, I, I kind of approach problems in quite an analytical way. When we approached Lick, we really tried to understand why the user journey was offline and and, and how we could solve it and, and understand what, what was going to change and what the factors were that were influencing that market. And I, I do the same now. I wouldn't start a business to... Um, I wouldn't think about what would sell right now, what would do well right now in this current environment, because this is a te hopefully this is a, a temporary environment, um, unless you want to just make a quick fast buck. But if you want to build a business, I would try and understand what what the new norm is likely to be. And I think what the new norm is probably just what we were seeing before, but a lot of markets accelerating and the change accelerating. So remote working has always been here. Many people will remote work, but I think a lot of people. Um, that are running businesses are seeing that their companies can work remotely and that they enjoy working remotely. So that that has changed. It's the same with e-commerce. Um, I think a lot of businesses in e-commerce probably aren't actually positioned in the true scale. You take Ocado, um, which obviously is doing extremely well, but they they have to think again on how they support if everyone is purchasing um, online. So I would just start to look at industries and markets that I think would maybe accelerate um, in this current environment, but not for the short term, for the long term. But yeah, um, I, sorry, Lucas, I was just going to, that, that phrase is, uh, I feel like is super important right now, the long term. And what's hard with this situation is you're like, you're having, you feel like you're having to make short term decisions because of cash, because of change, because of like the, 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 the 24 seven news cycle is like, well, we'll go change everything. And whereas actually it, it's also brought home um, the, the importance of like the cri the global crises, whether it's pandemic or climate or uh, race or whatever it is, they're all coming to the fore. And so actually we need to get better at thinking long term. A lot of the systems don't work. And so purposeful business, conscientious business, sustainable careers, solving problems that basically, you know, are going to last a long time. And so this is just a, this is a shift in some ways, as you were saying, it's accelerating, but, it, but actually thinking long term is so crucial. Um, and I, so my particular interest in this is like learning communities, which which we're all part of anyway. But what we're trying to do with Rebel Book Club is, you know, it's just like the whole thing of like, well, how can we we're seeing with our children, like be making learning such a like a passion that people can do it wherever and whenever. Um, and also there's a big learning gap in the world, whether it's literacy or wherever. So how can we help with those? Um, so we have a bunch of questions flying in. Um, I'm going to try and pick pick one or two out that, that we can help with. Uh, Claudine, who I think is our friend from uh, Ireland, says, um, how do you convince clients that this is a good time to invest in your services and things are so unstable? And, and we know this is particularly true for female founders right now. It's it's looking like it's even harder to raise funds. But um, how how do you raise money in uh, a world that's heading towards or a, or a you know, region of the world that looks like it's heading towards a recession. Who wants to have a crack at that? I can jump in. Thanks, Gary. Um, I think for for kind of first time entrepreneurs or, or entrepreneurs starting a new business, I think the most obvious um, starting point would be starting with um, looking at your extended network or trying to build that extended network to um, put in put in money from people that already kind of believe in you. Um, and I think there is a pro and a con with that in today's world in the sense that obviously not every entrepreneur has access to that network. Um, I know that when I was starting Huckle Tree, I wouldn't have had access to um, friends and family fundraising if it wasn't for my then co-founder who helped us bring in our, our seed round. But I think that with all the kind of networking events and opportunities that are happening in the digital world today, there's a big opportunity to make those connections. Um, so I guess that's where I would start. I would really start like trying to build a network around me um, of of uh, potential angel investors. And is the best way to build that network, Gabby? And uh, you know, I know there are a hundred ways, but from your experience and also seeing what happens in your community, is it like this whole extrovert thing of put yourself out there, write every day videos? What what's the what tactics have you seen? Um, and Lucy, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on this. Of like how to effectively build that network. I think, um, look, I think that there are, there are definitely people that are great at putting themselves out there on social media and can use use that to 
build their network. I'm not entirely sure it would be the right, the, the, the most appropriate network for fundraising. I think um, there are probably organizations that can help, not wanting to pitch ourselves, but Huckletree, you know, with our accelerator program and educational programs that then introduce uh, those entrepreneurs to um, investors, you know, that's, that's a, a kind of good starting point. Um, and there are just so many events online every night. If you, you know, events like this where you can network and where you can really meet people and and, and kind of broaden your your own network. I think that's really the way to go. Um, I'm not sure if Instagram does the uh, does the seed funding trick. <laughs> not sure it works. Not for everybody. Uh, Lucy, what are your thoughts on on funding? Um, well, I mean, in all honesty, I haven't raised any. So I, I'm, I'm slightly less able to contribute on this particular point, but I would certainly say scattering yourself around hundreds of different places is a really bad idea. Um, you just wear yourself thin and you're gonna get loads of rejections. So unless your confidence can take it, I really wouldn't bother. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense to be targeted and to get good feedback um, from a range of different people. There are organizations out there that will help. In fact, I help support an organization, the Capital Pilot, that I know does that incredibly well and will channel and say, here's some investors that have got the best chance of investing in your product. But before you talk to them, you might want to address A, B, and C. And actually, that's probably going to boost your confidence as well. Um, so I'd say, I'd, I'd really just say it's about being as targeted as you can and knowing your market well. But I don't think that's particularly. I'm not speaking from experience. No, yet. but it's, it's it, all reminders are important at this at this time. Lucas, how did you you obviously raise before um, this pandemic, but it's still always challenging. What what have you learned about this journey? Yeah, I think it's really important to not not solve that problem when you're raising. I mean, the the, the people, the angels, and the VCs that we spoke to, um, I had started speaking to even as long as ten years ago, and um, building those relationships. Um, yeah. Made sure I was going to as many meetings as I can uh, and also um, you know helping out as best I can making con making introductions where, where I thought I might not get some immediate value but there might be something in the future and that all kind of came together when I created had quite a good network that I could approach that had known me for a long time I think I massively um, I definitely agree with Lucy I think uh, you've got to be targeted if you've got a if you've got a raising a C consumer business there's even if you get through the door of a series B uh, SaaS investor that they're, they're just you're not going to get anywhere with them so it's a waste of energy and waste of time there's definitely a lot of um, a lot of now in the UK and, the, and Europe in the way there wasn't uh, a lot of VCs for the different stages and, and a big angel network and, and quite a lot of information on what you need to show in your investment deck and and what the types of businesses they look at so it's um, it's about preparing yourself for a long time and building those connections I think right now is 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 a challenging market for some people to raise. You know, I think if you've yeah. got to have a business right now, it's probably quite a challenging time to raise. But I think that the tier one VCs are definitely active. You know, a lot of these funds raised a huge amount of capital in in last year and the year before, and they've been fairly quiet for the last six months. Uh, and they're definitely investing in businesses that will uh, scale in the new normal and also um, maybe infrastructure and facilitate those businesses that will scale. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's people are still investing um, as, as we can. I think the yeah. reality is, I mean, if you've got a brilliant business that's growing and scaling, the investors will come and knock on your door. Yeah, which is why getting some proof of concept as quick as you can is, is always the best approach. Yeah, you and I think, uh, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the tricky thing is, um, totally agree with, with both Lucy and Lucas, what you've just been saying. The tricky thing is, is obviously, if you're if you're basing your valuation on revenue multiples and your revenue has dropped during this period, it's a tricky one to kind of you know reset where your valuation needs to be or how you value the company. Um, and I don't have the answer to that, but um, but I think we we are going to see lower valuations across the board. Lucas, from your experience, are you and forgive me if I'm prying, but are you seeing you know valuations? You did you close the round pre lockdown, pre COVID? No, we, we're, we signed a term sheet now, so we're right in the middle of closing that round. Um, and yeah, I think from the people that I've spoken to, the, the founders that have, have um, that are raising at the moment, they're definitely seeing valuations drop. Uh, and I think it's understandable for, for venture partners to, to realize that you know, they can invest at lower valuations, especially a business that's, that's struggling during this period. Um, but it all depends, I guess, on, on, on your growth and how, and what stage you're at uh, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, it's 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 definitely something I would I would think about sooner rather than later. And I'd also speak to founders as well, other founders. I think most people, um, obviously everyone's very busy, but most people are quite open to helping because they know the journey they've been on and how valuable other people that have helped them have, have sort of meant they've got to where they are. So I would honestly reach out um, because you'd be surprised um, maybe the response you'll get. I'd yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, and the goodwill is 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 there for entrepreneurs and founders more now maybe more than than ever um the other thing this all reminds me of is of course like being as lean as as possible and, and it's not it's not always possible depending on what product or service you're developing but the the lean startup approach and the bootstrap and the way of just trying to validate especially without spending so it, as you were just saying yeah. trying to raise money without having much evidence of traction is is really hard especially beyond uh a, a small crowd so um so definitely try and be creative uh, validate creatively there's a great online community that i I'm, I'm on sort of weekly get weekly and daily updates from called indie hackers and uh it's it's spun out of the you know it's an american community out of the stripe network but it's really interesting because they just celebrate people um getting to what might seem as relatively small business milestones 100 email uh signed up to a newsletter the first sale you know the first hundred unique visits on a site so they celebrate them as a community and it's really positive and it just makes everyone push that little bit more without spending or raising money so it's a, yeah, it's a great that, space that highlights a problem i think in the startup community you assume that you need to raise money to be successful and i think you almost people celebrate when they do raise money but actually for every person that's you know that thinks that's the way to go build a business is someone that believes that bootstrapping is the right direction and and uh, raising money is the wrong direction. So I think that's very, very, very true. So this brings us to an, another really important question, which has come up a couple of times on the chat just now. Um, and it's not just relevant to the times that we're in today, but it's it's around uh, who do you start a business with? So a couple of people have asked, how do you know, uh, or how do you go about finding a co-founder and how do you know this is the right person to start with? And I guess that question has, has extra importance when when the world is in flux. Gabby, what do you think? Um, I think it's a it's a brilliant question, and there isn't an obvious answer. The way that I um, so I mentioned that I kind of started Huckle Tree with a co-founder who then left the business, and and since you know relatively early on, I've been kind of hand in hand with Andrew, who's my my co-founder. Um, and we were. Um, I think the first thing is it's is that it's very unlikely that you'd meet a co-founder through. Um, again, it's kind of an extended network situation. I found and I've seen in our in our kind of businesses in the community. Um, it's not. It's rarely something that you know a founder puts a job advert out and and, and yeah. recruits their co-founder. Um, and then once you um, once you have met someone or you've been introduced to someone. Um, or maybe a couple of people. I think it's really important to spend as much time together as possible. And I know this has been said, but it literally is like a marriage. Um, if the business is successful, you're going to be together day in, day out for five to 10 years, if not more. And so, you know, you need to make sure that you get along really well with that person. But I think that the most important area, at least I found with Andrew, with Andrew and I, was that we very early on hashed out the areas of the business that I would be responsible for and the areas of the business that he would be responsible for. In the beginning, we were kind of doing a bit of everything, but we knew which directions we were going in as the businesses grew and that our skill sets were um, were were complementary complementing of each other um in that regard and i think that's the most important thing because you do i see a lot of founders that have very similar skill sets and they're both kind of either creatives or they're both more you know stronger on the operational side but you know if they're the creatives then who is looking after the numbers who is focusing on cash flow um so i think it's just it's 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 quite an, an, an obvious no-brainer but it's really important that two co-founders have very different skill sets um, and passions in the business Thanks, Gabby. Lucy, what's your what, what's your thoughts on co-founders? Um, I'd agree. I there's definitely not. I mean, how do you meet your husband? I mean, it could be a million and one different ways, right? How, or your partner. Um, I don't think that there is a specific way of going about doing it. But I think almost like if you're if you've got the right product and you're growing and you've got good traction, the right investor will find you. I think I think if you're clear and you're authentic and you're honest about your goals that you're trying to pursue, then the right co-founder will find you as well. Particularly, I mean, I, I have a co-founder now, um, but it took it took three years. 
Um, and it wasn't a journey that I was really specifically trying to make, but it's just we got talking at dinner one night, another social enterprise dinner. Um, he was trying to solve the same problem, but had tech skills. And I was trying to solve the same problem, but didn't. Um, and then we got talking and then he liked this particular brand of shampoo that I was quite partial to. And that's kind of how you start. So, but I mean, right. it's early days. We'll start so the might, shampoo. He might be totally fed up with me in two months time. So watch this space. I might need another. <laughs> Lucas, I, are you, what does your team look like? Are you, are you got a co-founder? Yeah, I, I think that I have a, my co-founder, Sam. We actually met at work, um, which is actually a great way to meet because you, you understand how you work together. Uh, but I imagine places like Huckle Tree, Hot Desking, all their events are probably great great places and to meet and virgin events as well to meet like-minded people i mean it is fundamentally the most important decision i, uh, I made in, in starting the business with sam he's probably the happiest person i've come across and also is a thoroughly nice bloke and, and that's um that's really really important uh, you know there aren't any egos uh, he compliments my skill sets uh, now i'd say we're a team of seven which basically means we're seven co-founders um, and it's important just to Id identify as a founder where your skills, what your skills are, what you're good at and what you're bad at. And as Gabby said, try and fill those because um, you can't be good at everything. Can't do everything. Yeah. And if you have a founder that complements that and you, you, know, you like working and you're, you're on the same journey at the same time of your life, it's, it's, um, it, the value that, it's cr that can, can be created is huge um, because it's tough to build a business and to do that on your own. I mean, there's no way I would do it on my own. And one more thing that I just want to add in there also is, um, Lucy, obviously you mentioned the reference to kind of where would you find your husband? Um, and it's, it to I totally agree. That's exactly how, how I look at it. But I think one thing that we don't address when we're looking for a co-founder, when you're speaking about your kind of life partner, your husband or your wife, et cetera, you think about whether you have um, matching kind of fund fundamental morals and values. Um, and that isn't often addressed when you're thinking about your co-founder. Even me, when I was speaking about it, my initial reaction is to go straight to skill sets, which is super important. But underneath that, I think it's really important that in your co-founder, you found a kind of value match um, with regards to the business that you want to build, how you want to build it, um, the kind of team that you want to build, and ultimately forgetting about profitability, but what the legacy is of the business that you want to leave behind, whether or not the business succeeds or fails. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really important that, that co-founders are on the same page um, value-wise. Yeah, and then something that I've learned um, through, through all the various projects I've been involved with co-founders is that you, you've got, you don't get married on your first date, right? So if we're using this analogy, and yet you see people going, oh, is this, you know, I've met this person, is this going to be the one to, to really go into business with? Well, you've got to test that. And the question yeah. then comes up, well, how do you do that legally? Because it, we want to we want to secure this partnership at the start so that we're committed. Um, and that's, of course, where um, there's all sorts of things you can do where you set a cliff, you say, in terms of your equity, where you say, well, actually, if one of us leaves within a year, two years, three years, a bunch of that equity stays in the business so that the risk for the business itself to succeed isn't diminished by someone leaving early. They still earn their sweat um for whatever time period so there's ways of doing this uh, smartly and cheaply it doesn't have to cost you a lot of money legally um to just make sure that you protect yourself and most importantly the that those the values and the potential legacy that you start together because it's gonna hopefully soon outlive you um in terms of your participation in it so yeah uh take your time but also the other the other thing i've learned is you don't i guess we're going back to dating analogies again but you've got to you've got to kiss a lot of what's the phrase kiss a lot of there you go so you've got to get you've got to go out and network and, and meet a lot of people and spend time with people talking of princesses princes frogs andy's back with us <laughs> frogs i think that's frogs. a more fitting analogy there <laughs> um andy have i got time to field one more question that i've seen come up a few times before we before you take us move us into oh, the next of course section. you do yeah i'll drop back in five no, no, stay, stay, stay here, because okay. you've got lots to add, loads to add to this conversation. Um, the question that I see keep, keep, keep coming up tonight um, on various of these chat channels, I can see about three channels at the moment, is uh, Gabby, Lucy, Lucas, I'm about to start a food business, is now the right time to do it. I'm about to start a travel business, is now the right time to do it. Um, and so various sectors, basically, and is it the right time to do it? How, how, uh, as we're not experts in the, across all those fields, how do we answer that question? What's the, what's the response to someone who asks, should I start in this industry? Like, can you, can you see what's going to happen? How do you, how do you help this person out? Um, 
I'm going to jump in very quickly and just say nobody's got a crystal ball. You're not going to know how things are going to work out entirely. But what I can tell you is over the long term, people do don't genuinely regret the things they don't do more than the things they do do. So the short term, if you do something stupid, you trip yourself, you learn from it and you'll always be able to self-rationalize. If you interview people in their 80s, 90s about what they regret most, it's always that they didn't do something, they didn't try it. If you try it, it doesn't work out. You will rationalize it. You'll say, well, I learned from that and that's going to make my next product stronger. So that for me is by far and away the best advice I can give. Thanks, Lucy. Gabby, what are your thoughts on this? I think um, that we have a really clear picture today about what themes and behaviours have been accelerated by COVID um, and what uh, industries, verticals, products are likely to stick around. Um, and I think if you've identified a business in an area that um, has been positively impacted by, by COVID, that's a really good starting point. Um, and if that is the case, then I think it's a great time to start a business because you've got higher availability of talent. Um, so obviously a lot of people are going to be finding themselves out of work, even, you know, agency work, freelance work um, and just cheaper spend in general, sort of negotiating uh, good terms across kind of, you know, any of the ongoing products or, 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 or services that you need to pay for as a business will set you up in the right way over the next few years. So I think if, it, if you've identified, you know, uh, an opportunity that is likely to um, be in high demand post COVID, then I think that now is as good a time as ever, a great time actually to start a business. Great, Lucas, you got anything you wanna to add to that? I think uh, I think Gabby nailed it there. I think um, I'm fairly aligned with her thoughts. I think it's probably uh, in some ways an easier time to, to uh, start a business than, than go and find a job in the current market. Um, and I think yeah. if you're, if you're, if the well, that's a hang on, Lucas. That is a big shout. I know that's. Yes, yeah, I, know, I know you've got an entrepreneurial mindset, but to say that, I, are you talking about people who are considering it? To like to go and test a business idea is easier than to try and go and get a job right now. Well, I mean, if you're if you're currently out of work right now and you're thinking about setting up a business or going to find a job, it's probably a pretty good time to go and focus and sit down and try and start your business. I would say um that's going to change in a few months time but it's quite an interesting window to, to to give it a go i'd say okay there we go which matches up the interesting thing is that the poll that was done even before or as we've been talking i'm looking at it now um what do you think about starting something now 77 per se let's do it so anyway we're all we're all in this together andy what's been going on in the virgin startup community uh since covid uh, have you seen because this is a really diverse community across so many different industries most of them really early stage yeah what's what's <clears> been happening is it is there been a trend towards like new things happening or a lot of things failing or what what's the picture look like yeah it's been really interesting ben so so we we've had kind of seven years now of helping people start and scale businesses and there's about kind of four and a half thousand businesses now within the community that we've worked with funded over that period across a whole kind of range of industries and sectors. And I think the, the really interesting thing for me is that by and large, the vast majority of the businesses are actually surviving COVID and lockdown really well. And I think one of the things that we've seen in this perhaps goes to the heart of what it's like to be an entrepreneur is the resilience and the adaptability that we've seen from those founders and those businesses. And certainly some of the stories that we've seen come out even from some of the slightly more established businesses is that actually the last kind of three, four months has really forced people to, to think lean, to Gabby's point earlier, to focus on their runway. And they've kind of, in many respects, re-embraced a kind of a startup mindset that they had when it all began. Mm. Um, so I think in some respects, it, I, I don't want to understate how difficult the time it has been for yeah. a lot of founders and small business owners but it has also brought out the best in an awful lot of people. Um, I think that the collaboration that we've seen within the ecosystem has been great. So how startups have looked to support one another, whether that be partnering up to share logistics or storage or kind of partnering on social media campaigns. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of goodwill there. And I think everybody wants the, the startup community and the small business community to not only survive, but thrive. And to say it's not without its challenges, but we've seen an awful lot of good stuff come out the last few months as well. 
That's great to hear. And just in terms of Virgin Startup, how are how are you helping those who are who are struggling right now, or or even thinking about starting? What's what what can Virgin Startup do? Yeah, sure. So I mean, we we've really focused on over the last kind of three to four months on helping that existing community. So we started running kind of extra uh, mentoring sessions and ask the expert sessions. Um, we quadrupled the business support helpline that we provide. Um, it was really about looking at how we can support that existing community through what was a really difficult time. I think what we've seen is actually over kind of recent weeks, certainly, there's now an increase in the number of people that are looking to start up again. So we've now got this kind of um, kind of two sides to what we do. It's continuing to support those existing businesses and helping them navigate this time. Um, so we ran something called the Lockdown Series, which was a series of webinars led by different experts on all of the different areas that you might be considering as a founder at this time. And so that was incredibly well received, but it's how you continue to support those existing businesses whilst also supporting the growing number of people um, that are looking to start up. So to Lucas's point when he said, actually, it's arguably easier to start a business than it is to get a job. I think if you look back at previous times of recession, as unemployment increases, new business starts increase. And that's something that we're already starting to see um, so we funded double the number of businesses in May as we did in April, um, and that's a trend that we, we see continuing. Um, so we're launching in the next couple of months a new How to Start a Business series, um, really to help those people that are starting to think about whether starting a business is right for them um, and how to navigate that. And you've also made this year a commitment to support 50% female, uh, fifty percent of your funding to go to female founders. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. And it's something I'm kind of personally very passionate about. Um, and this kind of came about um, October last year, really, off the back of um, something called the Rose Report that really looked at the under underrepresentation of women um, in business in the UK. So currently only one in five startups has a female founder. And the further you go down the startup journey, um, the more underrepresentation that you see. So by the time you get to VC funding, um, only 1% of all of the VC funding um, last year went into all female teams. And I said, that's something that we think needs to change. And our 50-50 pledge was really trying to level the playing field and address some of the barriers that exist. Um, so we've made a commitment to fund an equal number of men and women by the end of 2020. Um, but that's not a kind of one-off target. This is something that we're trying to embed sustainably um, across what we do. Fantastic. 